Dr. Ali Kana for your wisdom. Where we grow the food that we eat. We own the commercial farms, the massive commercial farms. We own the industries that manufacture everything that we need. That is true liberation economically. That is true ownership. And that is the ownership we are talking about. Nothing less. We are no longer satisfied by owning a, a grocery store at the corner of the street. That's not good enough. We want true ownership of those entities that control the economy that they can no longer come in and destabilize us because they own everything that is the pillar of development in every African country. The answer to that is hell no. We can no longer stand up for that. We know better. We are supremely qualified to build our Africa. All we gotta do is wake up my brothers and sisters, wake up. Why do we find it so difficult? to trust each other, to believe in each other. Because I believe in what we can do together. This is where we are today, we are here today to talk about way forward. To have you ask that question, what Africa are you gonna leave behind? for your children, grandchildren, and generations to come? Are you satisfied with your children living the life that you have lived? I know how we live in this diaspora. Some of us work two, three jobs to make ends meet, and we work till we die. Our children are gonna do the same thing. Work two, three jobs till they die. To what end, my brothers and sisters? To what end? The inheritors of such an amazing continent. All we gotta do is get up, unite, and take care of it. Take care of it. Let's get involved in mining. Let's mine our gold. Let's mine our own minerals. And because we will be united, we can dictate how much we want to sell our minerals for, not for the buyer to say, I'll pay you so much. And we say, okay, that time is over. That time is over. And this is why we are here today, to begin to prepare for us to answer that question to our grandchildren and generations to come. Let's let the world know that black people are now united. We may have been asleep for over 400 years. We are now awake from our slumber. We now refuse to continue to be brainwashed. We know their game now. And we know how we're gonna st strategize to get ourselves out of this conundrum that we've found ourselves in as a race. That we collectively agree that the insanity that we have been through the insanity that we have suffered from for centuries, insanity no more. Insanity no more. And we are going to be the generation that's gonna turn the corner and that journey begins today. With all of you media people, we're counting on you to redo and rewrite our history, to tell the truth and nothing but the truth about us and our continent to re-educate not only us, but the world. Even white people need the education. Many white people don't even realize they're racist. They need education. I read a book called Africa. It doesn't matter where you see us. It's black people in America, black people in Africa, black people in the Caribbean, in South America, in Europe, all over the world. Nobody was, left, was exempt. This strategy has speculated through every one of us. The self-hate, the mistrust, the lack of belief in ourselves and in each other. It's a pandemic that we're having to deal with as black people. But we even realize it as a pandemic that's worse than COVID because it misses no one. It affects every black person. When? are we gonna wake up from our slumber? 
Because if we do not, it doesn't matter how much we get together, nothing will be accomplished because our minds are still in the gutter. Our minds are still fast asleep. We are completely brainwashed. And we need to understand that. You see, for you to go seek help from a doctor, you got to understand, first of all, that you're sick. But if you don't think you're sick, how are you going to get help? When you go to that negotiating table with a colonized mind, garbage in, garbage out. When you go to Africa today, look what's happening in the Congo, what's happening in Cameroon, what's happening in Somalia, what's happening in Mali, what's happening in Niger. Who are the people you see holding the guns? It's not white people. It's black people holding the guns. It's us killing each other. We're being pe given peanuts to kill each other. Have you ever wondered a continent that doesn't have a single gun manufacturing plant? We have endless supply of guns. If you wanna know what is going on in our Africa, I often say, when you hear something happen in Africa, look for the story behind the story. You wanna know what's going on in our Africa, follow the guns. The conversation we are embarking on today is to see where we can say, how do we come together as children of one mother Africa? Can we please be the generation that's going to put an end to this carnage? Can we please be the generation that's going to turn the corner and begin to tell our children the truth and nothing but the truth. Imagine 20 years from now, you have your granddaughter, you have your grandson, and they're gonna ask you, grandpa, grandmother, there were problems with our Africa. There were problems with our black race. What did you do? What did you do, grandma? What did you do, grandpa? Why must I live in a world that I'm going to be hated simply because of the color of my skin? Why must I live in a world afraid to be the next George Floyd? What is your answer going to be, my brothers and sisters? That we did nothing. Just like our parents and grandparents, we did nothing. And are we just going to continue to be the underdogs? The mothers and fathers of humanity are going to continue to be treated as the scum of the earth. I would hope your answer to your grandchildren is that my granddaughter, my grandson, together with my brothers and sisters, we got together. We understand that what was taken away from us pivotally is denial of economic liberation. Economic liberation was denied to black people across the globe. Even in this beautiful United States, had the black people been given the promised 40 acres and a mule, their conditions, their economic situation will be very different. As African countries were quote unquote getting their liberation from the colonizers, we were given limited political liberation to this day, but economic liberation was never given to us. The multinational companies that ran and operated in those countries that the colonies held, they remain in those countries to this day. They are the major employers in every African country. If you were a British colony, the majority of the multinationals in your country are British companies. If you were a French colony, the majority of the multinational companies in your country are French companies. They're the major employers and employing thousands of people. And if the heads of states try to force them to pay taxes, and by the way, most of them don't pay taxes. They have safe havens where they keep their money. They underreport what they mine. They underreport what they're, what they're selling, what they mine for. The end result is they don't pay taxes. They had their money, safe havens. They are involved in illegal trade, illegal mining, illegal fishing. In it, anything you can think of that they could steal out of Africa, they're involved in. 
The end results, trillions of, of dollars are getting out of Africa every year. And they return back 50 billion as aid. And we Africans are very happy to receive that aid. And we will thank them from hell to high heaven for giving us peanuts out of what they would have stolen from us at night. So I hope your answer to your grandchildren is, my brothers and sisters, we all got together. We analyzed our circumstances. We spoke about what was really going on. We educated each other about what was really going on. And that we should not be allowed to be thrown a shiny object and run after the shiny object when the real issues are over here. That example is about, for example, when I used to uh, travel around the country, the minute I would finish talking, the first question, 100% of the time, but ambassador, the African leaders are corrupt. I don't disagree. We have corruption issues in Africa at every level, down to the person who is leading the janitorial department. We gotta go after the corruption. 50 billion is a lot of money, let's go after it. However, let's not go after 500 billion because we are being told to ignore that. It was a shocker for me to realize the corruption among African leaders was the beginning, the middle and the end of every conversation to do with Africa. Until I started talking about the Pact for the Continuation of Colonization. The question I had for the diaspora was, I understand your outrage over the $50 billion out of corruption. That's what the corruption watchdogs say is coming out of Africa from corruption. I said, where is your 10 times outrage over the, 50 of the, over the $500 billion taken by France from 14 African countries? And that's when there was silence. They just simply did not know. If we're gonna talk about corruption, let's talk about all corruption because we gotta deal with all of it. Tell me one African leader, one African country that has changed a leader and things changed, none. We can change leaders like we change clothes in Africa. Nothing is gonna change because the fundamentals have not yet been addressed. Allow me to use the example of a tree. We have issues above the ground and issues below the ground. To the best of my ability, let me give you examples of issues above the, the ground and issues above the tree as they pertain to our Africa. So you can have a clearer understanding of what's at stake here. The issues of leadership, the issues of corruption, Issues of lack of access to educate, quality education, healthcare, infrastructure. Those are the trees, the leaves, the flowers, the branches above the tree that fall off one season after the other. And we complain. And as long as we don't address the issues of the root, the issues above the tree will continue. We can change leaders all we want. We might succeed at maybe one year, we have a good healthcare system but pretty soon supplies will begin to fall off because we have no manufacturing. What's at the bottom, what's in the root is France, for example, taking over 500 billion out of Africa, forcing the leaders to only acquire military equipment from them. Do you think France is gonna sell them superior military equipment than them? forcing the countries to get their military trained by them. Do you think France is going to train them better than their own military? Being forced by France to say, we will occupy your countries, we will have military presence and can invade you without notice if we feel that our interests are being violated. Your natural resources discovered and yet to be discovered. France is the first right of refusal the locals get what France companies don't want. Contracts, large or small, 
private or public. French companies have the first right of refusal. And of course, some of you are saying, well, why haven't the leaders done something about it? Well, you all know the history. Of the 65 older coups that have taken, in, taken place in Africa, 22 African heads of states were assassinated or imprisoned. 16 of those are from former French colonies. Majority of them had wanted to pull away from the pact for the continuation of colonization. So the reality is to talk about the pact for the continuation of colonization, it became a no go to place because you do that, you find your head on the chopping block. It was just that simple. The fear of the colonizers, my brothers and sisters, is real to this day. The consequences are real. Let's make no mistake about it. How do you tell a man growing up in Botswana, struggling to make ends meet and run his business to think continental? It's not possible. But us in the diaspora, to whom much is given, much is expected. We have the ability to look at our Africa with a bird's eye view. We have the ability to mobilize our, our resources, financial resources. The brain drain has left Africa without the capacity, intellectual capacity that Africa needs to build the Africa we want. The brains that Africa needs are in the diaspora. The brain drain out of Africa started over 400 years ago. When they took the Africans out of Africa as slaves, they took the brightest and the fittest, the ones they thought would survive the transatlantic journey. So to the African-Americans, African-Caribbean, African-Latino, to you, I say, don't you ever let anyone make you feel inferior. You are a product of the cream de la cream the world had even after they have taken the smartest and the fittest out of Africa, 50% of them still perished in the Atlantic. So you know, the ones who made it were the best of the best. I don't know of any race that could have gone through what black people have gone through and are still standing. We are indeed indestructible. So I hope my brothers and sisters together when you sit down to have that conversation with your granddaughter and your grandson, you will tell them what we would have done beginning today. That we came together, we deliberated on the issues that we were faced with. We made a commitment that we shall be the race. We shall be the generation that's going to turn over a new leaf. We shall be the generation that's going to say enough is enough. No more shall our children grow up in this world worrying and fearing to be the next George Floyd. It's not enough to mourn George Floyd. Do something about it. We can't continue to be noisemakers and do nothing. We have to change our thinking. Quite often we do a, prog a, 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 a business plan. We have a project. Nicely done. Next thing you know, we are looking for funding. And we are going back to the same people who have oppressed us, who have these strategies to keep us where they want us to be. Does that even make any sense? To my sisters on this call today, think of the clothes, the dresses, the shoes, the handbags that you have in your closet with tags on. what we can do with very little, what we can do with what we consider pocket change. A thousand of us with a thousand dollars, that's a million dollars. A million of us with a thousand dollars a year, that's a billion dollars. That's only $83 a month that we are saying, let's think like other races do. How do you think the Jewish fund was started? They started with whatever you can give. The more of us that come up with our 83 bucks, we can develop, we can build an African fund, African diaspora fund that will blow the world away. 
There are over 300 million of us. Whatever you can commit, make a commitment. And I'm insisting that don't make it anything that will be painful. No, anything that, whatever you can afford to give away, that's what you do, that's what you donate. So you can tell the children, before we go to McDonald's, did we put aside our $83? And we teach them that this has got to go to the diaspora fund. That's how we're gonna build our Africa. That's how we're gonna claim our economic liberation. Let's make no mistake, it, no mistake about it. No money, no voice. It is just that simple. It boils down to the economics. We cannot go to the same people who are oppressing us and beg them for money. But what happens when you go begging them for money? You have to give them all your information. You got to turn off everything, including your great grandmother's middle name. So what control do you have? When I know if you were all to come together and put whatever little money that you have into a fund in a coordinated way, the sky is the limit. We have a responsibility to show the world that we're just as good as anybody else, that we can no longer continue to be somebody else's underdog, that we can no longer continue to be taken for granted. We're just as smart as anybody else. And we do not need anybody to define us as who we are, because we know who we are. The beautiful, intelligent, sophisticated, highly adaptable, and totally indestructible. So 20 years from now, I hope we, you and I can begin the journey. So when that question comes from our grandchildren, we'll be able to say, granddaughter, grandson, sit down. United with my brothers and sisters, this is what we did. We pulled our pennies together. This is how much we have accomplished. While the mission is not yet accomplished, while the journey continues, this is where we live off. And this is where you and your brothers and sisters are going to pick up. And you got to unite in order to finish this journey. But the end game is, the children of Africa, in Africa and around the globe, can no longer continue to be disrespected, can no longer continue to be treated as the scum of the earth, and can no longer continue to be called poor when we are the inheritors of the richest continent on earth. We must own our Africa, the good, the bad, and the ugly. The building of the Africa we want is our responsibility and ours alone. We can no longer allow others from the East, from the West to take over the implementation of the African continental free trade area, which is scheduled to begin next, next year, this next month, really. There's a seed that has our name as African diaspora. If we vacate that seed, we are going to be vacating the ability to defend our children's inheritance. If we do not come together for ourselves, we must come together for the sake of our children and generations to come. What Africa has belongs to them. We're at a crossroads, crossroads at this moment. If we do not unite, the African continental free trade area is the beginning of undoing the Berlin Conference. The African continental free trade area is exactly what the Pan-African this is how they got us, my brothers and sisters. They got us at the core of who we are. They destroyed us from the core. And until we understand that we are part of a bigger strategy, bigger strategy to make us hate ourselves in a manner that it is impossible for us to unite just like other races do. We live in this country of the United States. You ask for the voices of the Chinese diaspora loud and clear. Ask for the voices of the Irish, the German Americans, Italian Americans, the Jews, the Mexicans, they are all loud and clear. They stick together like superglue. They have an unspoken camaraderie that if they end up in a, in a, in, in a meeting 
and they're Chinese and, and, and they're white people and they're Indians and they're Mexicans. They have a tendency to just drift towards each other. It's an unspoken camaraderie. We have failed to rebuild that which was destroyed among us. Have you ever wondered how this strategy was implemented that it is not missing a generation. From one generation to the other, the stupidity continues. Even though we know very well that what we are doing is stupid, what we are being told is a lie, but somehow we don't know how to undo it. We don't know how to stop us, stop ourselves from doing the dumb, stupid things we do as black people. Let me take my message home. Today, as we speak, a black man could have his business in a black neighborhood. The minute a Chinaman comes into that same neighborhood, we black people will stop patronizing the black man, walk right past his shop to go to the Chinaman because his ice is colder. Let's turn it around. Now let's take the black man to go to Chinatown. Open your business in Chinatown. How many Chinese will patronize you? Zero. None. That's if you even get the opportunity to have a permit to open a license in their neighborhood. They will not allow it. We know that all as well. We know we cannot own a business in Chinatown. So why are we letting them own businesses in our neighborhoods and we say nothing and we actually put our own brother out of business? That same self-hate is alive and well among us. Why have we failed to undo this for our sheer survival? My brothers and sisters, I'm here today. We are here to discuss how you all people in the media, the ones who set the tone, how can we come together and begin to undo the lies? The lies that we have been told for centuries. The, the lies that are now such an important, essential, pivotal component of the fabric of who we are. It's not gonna be easy to undo them. But the journey starts with understanding what has been done. Realizing that you're part of somebody else's agenda. That you're riding somebody else's train, heading in the direction of those others who wish and have always exploited us. The question is, when are you gonna wake up and chart your own path and ride your own train, heading towards your own destination? This moment, my brothers and sisters, is calling for us to have that conversation. This moment is calling for us to wake up. And we're counting on, on you media people who are our CNN. If you all came together and began to speak our truth all around the world, we can reach more people, more people than we could ever reach with an ad on CNN. You media personalities, our internet radio stations, our internet televisions, small as you are, but when you come together, you're bigger than CNN. You're bigger than CNN. So that ability for us to come together, it starts with us appreciating that we are in the intensive care, critically ill from the legacy of slavery and the legacy of colonization. That until we heal from these two ailments, nothing, and I mean nothing that we try to do is going to succeed because the crab mentality will always prevail. We call it the PhD, pull her down, pull him down. We suffer from that disease and we are in the intensive care. Accept that. I often talk to my friends and I'll talk about the legacy of slavery and colonization. And you will be surprised almost 100% of the time, my friends would say, oh, I'm so glad I don't have that problem. And I'll say, well, you are wrong, my friend, because you do. And then you begin to give them examples of the things that we do. We are on an automatic pilot of stupidity that has got to end. You tell me why today Africa continues to be exploited to the extent that we do. We do not add value to our natural resources. 
75, 70% of the cotton in the world comes from DRC. Can you imagine if DRC was to come together and say everything that requires cotton has got to be manufactured in DRC. Every chip, microchip that needs cotton must be manufactured in DRC. That means every cell phone, every laptop, every electric battery that requires cells, uh, cotton has to be, the microchips must be manufactured in DRC. Do you know how many jobs we could create? Do you know how many millions of jobs we could create with one mineral? And yet they look at us and say, why is there youth unemployment? Hell, you're taking all our natural resources. You're putting trade policies that make it difficult for Africans to, to dictate how they sell their minerals, how they add value. The international trade policies are totally against Africa and its development, and it's by design. Have you ever wondered how much all the Swiss chocolate, Swiss coffee that we see all over African hotels, African grocery stores. Since when did Switzerland grow coffee? Since when did Switzerland grow co cocoa beans? 65% of the cocoa beans come out of West Africa. Where is Heshi City in West Africa? Where is Cadbury City in West Africa? Do people in those cities even know that those cocoa beans are coming from West Africa. All they provide is milk and water. But nobody questions that. Why is it difficult for African countries to come together and say, no, we don't need to export our hot choc chocolate. We don't need to export our cocoa. We are going to manufacture it in Africa for distribution to the Africans. We can no longer continue to send the cocoa beans out only for Africans to buy the hot chocolate and the chocolate and the coffee. Our coffee from East Africa, our tea from East Africa. Some of the best are taken to Europe and they're renamed only for Africans to buy them as if they originated from another country. Why are we allowing this stupidity to go on? It's because we are not united. And that takes me to the Berlin Conference. Berlin Conference, if you're going to understand why Africa is today, you must understand the Berlin Conference. Some might think the Berlin Conference is a piece of history. It's a thing of the past. I used to hear diaspora ask me that all the time. Ambassador, why do you keep talking about the Berlin Conference? It's a thing of the past. I am sorry to say, my brothers, for those who choose to remain ignorant, and these are educated people with PhDs, the Berlin Conference is alive and well. The colonizers, did not spend four months in the cold Berlin winter from November of 1884 to February of 1885, just for the heck of it. They did not spend four months to strategize on how to prosper Africa. They spent the four months strategizing on how to see to it that Africa and her children are forever defeated and dominators. May I, Portugal, Belgium, they met in Berlin to strategize on how to see to it that Africa and her children are forever defeated and dominated. So how did they do it? They got up every morning, sat up around a great big old table with a great big old map of Africa across from them. They knew they had some powerful kingdoms that if they did not have a solid strategy, they would never defeat Africa. So the larger and powerful a kingdom was, the more countries that came out of that kingdom. And on top of that, they assigned these little bitty countries to different colonizers who spoke different languages for maximal destruction. Yes, divide and conquer. I often say, imagine you're driving from Zambia. You're speaking English. You're going north. Pretty soon you are in Angola, you're speaking Portuguese. Keep driving north, next thing you know, you're in DRC, you're speaking French. Go a little west, you're now in Equatorial Guinea, you're speaking Spanish. Veer a little bit north, you're in Southern Cameroon, you're speaking English. 
still in the same country, keep going north, you're now in Northern Cameroon, you're speaking French. And before you know it, you're in Nigeria, you're speaking English. Keep going west, now you go through the little slither of countries, they are really counties, Benin and Togo, you're speaking French and before you know it, you're in, you're in Ghana, you're speaking English. And keep going, next thing you know, you're in Cote d'Ivoire, you're speaking English and keep going, now you're in Liberia, you're speaking English. Cote d'Ivoire was French. It was all by design to cause maximum destruction. So what happens when you cause these divisions? Give it two, three generations, people who were once one, they no longer know each other. They don't recognize themselves as family. They now speak different languages. What are you disrupting? You are disrupting their ability to trade with each other. So they told us you're different countries. During colonization, they led us from their capitals. If you were colonized by the British, you were led from London. If you were colonized by the Germans, you were led from Berlin. If you were colonized by the French, you were led from Paris. And then of course, after we had a few of us, Pan-African leaders who began to sprung up and demanded civilization, I mean, sorry, independence. Some were given their independence, others had to fight for it. End result, we ended up with these little bitty countries that cannot survive on their own. Little bitty countries that took Carta Blanche, the laws of the colonizers, implemented them, and we, to this day, we are still following the laws of the colonizers. The policies of the colonizers, we are cast, accepted them, Carta Blanche, we continue to use them to this day. Have you ever wondered why we still need visas to travel from one African country to the other. While we have issues that go back to colonization that we have no control over, there are certain issues that we are capable of taking care of ourselves. But because we're suffering from this disease, even that which we can do to take care of ourselves and improve our circumstances, we are incapable of doing so. As an African, I'm, I'm ashamed. When I would travel to Africa, an American friend can go through the immigration faster than me, the African. Why? That stupidity again. At the stroke of a pen, this could be taken care of. But no, I'm from Malawi and I'm from Kenya, I'm better. And I'm from Nigeria, I'm better, really? How are you better? The same disease. And we say these things without even thinking. Our history, we're still using colonial textbooks from colonization. We have so many educators right here in the United States and Europe and around the world. We could change the curriculum just like that. We know the truth. But to the same extent that we know the truth, somehow we're incapable of changing it. My brothers and sisters, do you see how disgusting this is? Even when we go to our own African countries, we're still disrespected, disrespected by our own children. I was at a restaurant standing in line to be seated. I've been waiting 15 minutes. A young white couple comes behind me and my husband. A young black girl, after having seen me and my husband waiting and we were next, but because the white couple came behind us, she was reaching behind us to call them first. Fortunately, the white couple said no. They came first. Grudgingly, she set us down. We gotta deal with that in Africa, that self-hate. Remember that little girl who thought the black doll was ugly? But that little girl has grown up now and she hasn't changed. She still thinks the blackness, anything black is not good. So where do we go from here? The onus is on us.